Krishna. Good afternoon. Family and friends, we've gathered here today to praise God and to celebrate the life and home going of Daniel, Matt, Brian, Clark. When I think of Daniel, I'm reminded in the, of the words of Jesus that's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Let's pray. As we bow our heads and close our eyes, I hope that we can blot out all the cares of the world right now that's outside these doors. And Almighty Father, we come together today with heavy hearts. Sometimes we're at a loss for words and we seek understanding for things that we just can't seem to understand. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit, your comforter, to descend upon each and every one of us here right now. Our friend Daniel was a, was a son, a father, a soldier, a combat medic, and a, a deputy. He walked along paths that not many of us see. He saw many glorious things and also witnessed many other events that we uh, can't even imagine. But Daniel was there to make a difference. He was special and his drive and determination were extraordinary. He belonged to a special group of people called the Peacemakers. He served in places of danger and difficulty in hopes of making things better. And I lift up his fellow workers that carry on that responsibility those people that are on our front lines that run towards danger instead of running the other way. Those who serve in the military, law enforcement, the ones in the medical fields and in our emergency services, Lord, clothe them with your cloak of armor, your protection and grace as these people continue to be in harm's way and they too try to make a difference in this world. It's important that we all realize that you are still in control, Lord, no matter what the circumstances or no matter all the chaos that surrounds us. We always need to trust and obey. You also promise that those who are weak and heavy laden can come to you for rest and peace. And Lord, we ask for that rest and peace and comfort right now. In the precious name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.
just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every stronghold Shine through the shadows Burn like a fire for the name of Jesus. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Lake Church where I get to serve as the pastor over at White Lake. Also bring you greetings from the county commissioners here in Bladen. But I don't stand here today as a preacher or as a politician. It's my privilege to stand here 
as part of a broken-hearted community. I can't explain the last couple of days as I've tried to drive through Elizabethtown from the lake to Bladenboro. And something's missing. There's just something special missing. Because you know that you're not going to pass Daniel. And you're not going to look into those eyes of bravery and courage. You're not going to greet him on the street to a bear hug. And some witty little saying that will make your day. So on behalf of a broken hearted community, I greet you. It's my privilege to have known Daniel for the last 24 years. In fact, the family was one of the first that we met when we moved to Dublin. They took us in and made us feel like family. Whether it was sitting at a table for a meal or gathering around the home for one of the many tragic times. I'm thankful for every opportunity. Cindy, that you and your family allowed our family to be part of yours. Along with, along with Dr. Summer and Cindy, you kept us alive when we first moved here, and we're thankful for that. Your sweet mama, Mona Dean, a gentle and sweet, talented and strong woman. Your daddy, Mr. Hugh, who taught Daniel and many people in this county that a good name was more valuable than riches. Was blessed to watch your kids grow up. Jeremy, the funny one, always cracking a joke, Always up to something, you better not turn your back on him. And Caitlin, the sweet one, always singing, always dancing. She would go with me when I would preach revivals. And I knew if she was there, she was going to move every heart in the room. And she would sing a song for me, What Could a Beggar Give to a King? And then there was Daniel, the tough one, witty and smart, the guy you wanted on your team. Every person in this room probably could tell a Daniel story. Just like the Daniel and the lions did, they're stories that you will never forget. But probably my favorite Daniel story took place when he was about 11 or 12 years old, something like that, give or take a year or two. And Daniel was babysitting. His great-grandma was very sick, and all of the rest of the family was there. And so Daniel was in charge. Daniel liked to be in charge. When I think of him, I think of that large and in charge kind of guy. So he was the babysitter in charge. And he was watching Jeremy and Caitlin, and he started smelling smoke. Now, he's just a kid, but he starts scoping it out. He's going from room to room, kind of clearing the scene, making sure nothing was on fire, because he would certainly be blamed for it if it was, or Jeremy won. And room by room, he could find nothing on fire. So he went outside to see if anything was wrong. And the boy got struck by lightning. Now maybe you didn't know that, but he literally got struck by lightning to the point that his braces fused to his teeth. And he survived being struck by lightning. That's pretty awesome. Every time you would see Daniel on the street, he would always say the same thing to me. How you doing, buddy? I'm living the dream. And he was. He was born to do what he did. He, di he discovered his call early in life. And whether serving in the military or with his beloved sheriff's department, he was living the dream. Let me just go ahead and tell you on behalf of Warren and myself and Brother Al, we, we prayed and we, we sought the right scriptures. And a couple of nights just laying awake and thinking, Lord, I, I need the right verse, something, some anecdote, something that I can share and then on Saturday afternoon, you will just invade New Light Church and, and, and just move in every heart. And, and I realized something. For such a time as this, there very well may not be that perfect scripture. Even Jesus, who the Bible says was the, was the word of God become flesh, he knew every verse of every scripture and lived it out. And even he wept bitterly in the garden the night before he died. He experienced our pain and our grief, but there are a few scriptures that I think are very fitting. John 15, 13, the Bible says, Greater love has no man than this, than he lay his life down for his friends. Every day, men and women, when you put on your badge and you, you put on your belt, what you are doing is more than putting on your armor, but you are laying aside your life. Your family saying goodbye, not sure if they will say hello again. And we are grateful. 
I want to share just in the few moments that I have three questions with you. Number one, do you and I recognize God's love? So many people don't recognize what God's love is, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it does, what it accomplishes in our life. God's love is is for you. God's love is in you. God's love is not about possessions and position. Maybe you're here today and maybe you're hoping, you know, if I just had that truck, that boat, that camper, that, that whatever, that I would truly be happy and have joy. Or maybe, maybe I'm up for the next promotion and maybe if I get that promotion, that will give me joy. My friend, may I say to you, it is the love of God that will give you true joy. It is the love of God that will sustain you. It's not about the stuff in your life, but it's about the Savior who gave his life because he loved you and me so much. Here's what God's love looks like. And when I look around this room, I see the love of God in your eyes. You are just in many ways like Jesus who laid down his life. The love of God is respect, integrity, courage, adrenaline, stamina, guts, all those things that God gives you to do what you do every single day. I think about Daniel in the lion's den. You know, Daniel went into the lion's den not because he wasn't afraid of lions. He was. But because he knew that God was with him. I'm thankful to know that you are a prayed for bunch. I'm grateful to know whether it's in our church or in the basement of the courthouse. We're praying for you. We're lifting you up. We love you. Our hearts were broken with yours on Monday evening. Ronald Reagan once said, for those that say there are no heroes, they simply do not know where to look. Heroes, they don't wear capes and leap tall buildings. No heroes wear badges and they run into burning buildings. They run into situations that most of us would run away from. I want to encourage you today as we think about God's love. And we think about the fact that God loved us enough that he gave us his son, but also that he gave us a young man named Daniel who radically changed and influenced our lives that we're better people today and our county's a better county. Our world is a better world because Daniel Clark once passed this way. But let me beg of you, don't let Daniel's death steal away the wonder and the honor and the glory of his life. All too often when sometimes when someone dies young and especially tragically, we let their death overshadow their life so that a year or five years or ten years from now when we think the name Daniel Clark, we don't think about the life he lived but somehow the death he died. And oh, what disservice that would do to Daniel. My second question for you today is do you realize God's love? Every person in this room is mentioned by name in the Word of God. You and I are the beloved. We are truly loved of God. And by the way, you might not know it, but you're loved by your community. This Bladen County community, and I know there's some foreigners in the room, but this Bladen County community loves you and is proud of you. We are honored by you and by your service to one another. The parade of cars that came by the house, Cindy, was humbling to see all of the cars and all of the people, some that had never met Daniel personally, but they recognized his face on Facebook and Bladen Online and other places. And they wanted to be there to show their respects. And my wife, Tiffany, said, do you think Daniel knew how much he was loved? Without trying to sound like a really old man, it took me back some 23, 24 years. And I thought about Sunday afternoons that I would spend just outside of Dublin playing Chinese checkers with a little old lady named Miss Olive. And that was Daniel's great-grandmother. And she was so loved, but I don't think she ever knew it. There was something there in that precious, tender little heart of that 80-pound soaking wet woman that she never truly understood that she was loved. I pray that you and I understand on this side of eternity just how much we are loved. There are two kinds of people here today. There are those that are loved and know it and those that are loved and just don't know it. Friend, you are loved. You are the beloved of God. The Bible says, but God so loved the world. 
That's you and me. That he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting eternal life. How thankful we are. Do you recognize God's love? Do you know it when you see it? Do you realize God's love? Down in the depths of your soul today, listen, your job for many of you, and I know not everybody in here is a a police officer, a fire EMT, but the vast majority are, or you at least have a tremendous heart for those who are. And it is a thankless job. Troopers, when was the last time you pulled somebody over and they looked you in the eye and said, thank you, thank you, thank you for stopping me? Of course not. But you're the first person they call when there's a need. Yours can be a very thankless job, and I pray that you realize that you're loved. Third question, and I'm done. Will you and I respond to God's love? You see, it's one thing to know that we're loved, and another thing, another thing to accept that love, to, to welcome that love and receive that love. Nothing is worse. Nothing is worse than to tell somebody you love them, and they just stand there aimlessly looking at you as if they don't know how to respond. My friend, God would say to you today, I love you so much that I gave my son for you. But will we respond to that love? The name Daniel means God is my judge. There's not a person in this room nor a person on this planet that will stand in judgment of Daniel. I'm thankful to know that Daniel, by a profession of faith, knew Christ, his character and his integrity was true. Someone said, well, you know, Daniel didn't go to church a lot. With all due respect, Daniel showed me and my wife more respect than many faithful churchgoers in this county do every day. There was something about that precious and tender heart of Daniel. We're in a room of first responders. Did you know that? We're safe. The county might not be right now, but we're safe in this room. (laughs) May I ask you something? Have you you responded to Christ? Nothing is, is more frightening than the call that goes out that there is no response to. We're fearful of parts of the remote parts of our county that one day there might be a call and nobody responds. We all acknowledge that that's a that's a real fear. But today, there might be some that would hear about the love of Christ, and yet even though you're first responders, you've not responded to those things that are first and foremost, and that is that personally, we have to do business with God. What is that call? All oh, the old hymn says, I have heard the, joy, uh, or the joyful sound, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. If you're here today and you've never responded to the love of Christ, I pray that you would. The Bible says if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth, then we shall be saved. That is a guarantee. It is a legal term. We shall be saved. And maybe you're here today and you say, well, preacher, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian, but, you know, I'm really not where I need to be. We're not trying to patronize Daniel or this situation. But the fact of the matter is that this is a wonderful opportunity to reflect. And so, you know what? It's time. It's time that I get serious about my faith. Here's the thing, you know, in this county, we're we're facing something, and and it's called delayed response times. The fact of the matter is, if there's a a call for some help, maybe in Kelly, and the nearest truck is in Clarkton, it takes a while to get there. Are you with me? The distance from one place to another means the response time is lengthy. The key is being close to Christ (laughs) so that we are able to respond Every single day by the grace and the peace and the mercy of God that we're close. That we don't have a long way to go when something like this happens. We're not constantly having a long journey back to Jesus, but we walk with him closely daily. There's lots of confusion in our county, lots of confusion in your minds now. Let me clear up a couple of confusing things that have been asked of me these last few days, if that's okay. Not based on my wit or my wisdom, but based on the authority of the Word of God. Because it will never fail. Number one, you and I do not go to heaven based on how we live. 
And many of you are living a wonderful life and you're honorable and we're thankful. But no matter how good of a life you live, it'll never be good enough. We don't go to heaven based on how we live. Number two, we do not go to hell based on how we die. Absolutely, without a doubt, we do not go to hell because of how we die. Eternity, heaven and hell, is based on this. Not how we lived and how we died, but how he lived and how he died. He lived a sinless, perfect life, and he died an atoning death so that when we die, we might live. I pray that's not overly simplistic, but the Bible makes it very clear. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. As I close, we've just come through Easter. Most of you were in church last Sunday. I hope you'll be in church tomorrow. But there was an event that took place just before Easter that gets lost sometimes in the Easter story. Did you know that Jesus wept? Jesus showed up for a funeral. And he showed up late. They had called for Jesus to come and heal Lazarus. But when Jesus got there, Lazarus was dead. And Jesus saw Mary and Martha and they're crying and they're angry and they're lashing out. It's, it's a beautiful picture of the grace of God because if I'm Jesus in that moment, I'm probably going to look and say, sit down, woman, and watch me work. But he didn't. He wept with them. My friend, what you're going through, I understand the tears and the brokenness and Christ does too. He said, well, I'm angry at God. Martha was angry at God. And Jesus still showed love and compassion. Mary was disappointed in God. Martha got up in his face. Mary got down on his feet. But they were both confused and conflicted. And Jesus decided he would just stop and weep a little bit with them. And I love that. It shows the tender mercy of our Savior. But, but he didn't just weep. But then he began to do what only Jesus could do. He said, take me to where you buried him. And Martha said, no, 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 Jesus, you don't understand. He's been, in the, he's been in the grave three days. You missed the funeral. You missed the wake. You missed the visitation. You missed the family feeding. You missed it all. And now you're going to show up. Jesus said, take me to where they've laid him. So finally they go to the place where Lazarus had been laid. In a grave, there was a stone rolled over it. And Jesus looked around and he said, well, somebody roll the stone away. Again, they said, Jesus, we can't do that. He stinketh by now. They rolled the stone away. I imagine everybody took a deep breath, wondering if Jesus was right, or wondering if Martha was right. And then Jesus did the most amazing thing. Jesus looked into that empty cave of death. And he said, Lazarus, come forth. And they waited, and there came Lazarus. He didn't run out, but he kind of began to come out real slow. And Jesus looked at him, and he's bound with the grave clothes, his face and his arms and his legs and his torso and his body. He's been wrapped up almost like we think a mummy. And he had come out of that grave. He was truly alive, but he was still bound. And Jesus looked around and he said, Somebody, loose him and let him go. And they did. So much so that the Pharisees tried to kill Lazarus because they said if people see Lazarus alive, they'll know Jesus is real. We got to kill Lazarus. Poor Lazarus, he just came back from the dead and they're trying to kill him again. Here's the point. Jesus knows your name, and he knows my name, and he knew the name of Daniel Clark and every one of us, and he makes that call. He gives us that invitation to respond to his love, and he would say to us, come forth out of that grave. And that's the picture of going from death to life to salvation. But maybe you're here today, and, and you're saved, and you're going to heaven when you die, but you live in hell on earth because you're bound all of the things that maybe even through this last week, 
the anxiety and the stress and the anger and the hurt and all of that and you're bound. And, and today our prayer is that Jesus might look at you and look at me. And by the way, it's our collective responsibility to help us be loosed and let go and say no more. But we're going to leave this place and we're going we're to rejoice in the fact that we got to know Daniel Clark. That our lives have been blessed by him and, and that one day we can see him again. My question is, responders, how will we respond to this situation? How will we respond to the gospel call? Face it, you spend your lives making sure everybody else is okay. But right now, at this moment, the most important thing is to make sure that you are. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that we can take comfort in. Thank you for your word that we can rejoice in. And I pray for the men and the women that are gathered in this room, both family and friends and professionals alike. God, that you would speak words to every heart. Help them to hear that call of salvation, that, that call to be loosed and let go. Father, thank you that you allowed our path to cross with this family so many years ago for the influence that they have had. But God, I pray that on this Saturday afternoon, you might, Lord, reveal your love to them, to every person in this room, and that we might respond. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a better life There's a better life If you got pain He's a pain taker If you feel lost He's a way maker If you need freedom Or save it He's a prison shaking savior If you got chains He's a chain breaker We've all searched for the light of day in the dead of night And we've all found ourselves worn out from the same old fight We've all run to things we know just ain't right And there's a better life Oh, there's a better life, yeah If you got pain, he's a pain taker Lost. He's a way maker. If you need freedom, save it. He's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. You believe it if you receive it. If you can feel it, somebody testify. If you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify, testify. Oh, if you believe it, if you receive it, if you can feel it, somebody testify. If you need freedom, save it. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Oh, if you need freedom, save it. He's a prison shaking savior. If you got chains, he's a chain breaker. Oh, he's a chain breaker.
Okay. Thank you all so much. Uh, Miss Cindy wanted you guys to know how good, you, good a job you did singing for us today. Thank you. And thank all of you for being here today. I know the family is very appreciative for everything that you've done for them. Every card, every call, visits, being on the road the other day, as Pastor Cameron says, it was just an awesome thing. Uh, I asked uh, First Sergeant Monroe, I said, wonder what Daniel would think about this. Because he'd have been leading it if he'd have had the chance for somebody else. Uh, he was always there. But uh, I thank you for allowing me to be here today, too. It's such an honor uh, to stand here and say a few words about uh, Daniel. And um, I'm going to talk about Captain Daniel Clark. <laughs> and uh, I'm, I, I've known him a long time uh, when he was a young man. But I, I really got to know him these last two years. Uh, more than I, I knew the other times. Um, he come up with my children, and uh, but um, I have cherished these, these last two years as I have thought about the things that we've been through. I'm gonna share a few things. <laughs> I can't share them all, but I'm gonna share a few. Um, but I, thought, I think about these two. If I had to go into battle and I could choose one person, I'd choose Daniel. Because he's going, and I, I, I'm going to get behind him. He's going to take care of the people that's with him. If, if I needed a person to have my back and stand for me, I would choose Captain Daniel Clark. And I know a lot of those that serve with him and under him know what I'm talking about because I've heard it echoed over and over again. On the lighter side of things, Daniel left a pick. Do y'all know that? You, you see that green coming, you better watch out, okay? I didn't know what was coming out. <laughs> um, we were having a recognition service at the sheriff's office the other week. <laughs> they already laughing back there. Uh, and I'm going to say this as delicately as I can. And I, I bounced in the side door like normal, trying to make sure everything was straight, you know. And, uh, and, and when I opened the door, there was a whole crowd standing there. I'm not used to that. You know, they were all, all lined up. Man, they had suits on, dressed up, everything, you know. And, and Daniel was there, and, and he, he was already talking, and he made a few comments to me. And then he said, uh, oh, I, I got to tell you another part. I was wearing a, um, a patch on my eye because I was seeing double vision. I look like a big pirate. And when I, when I bounced in after Daniel made comments, he come up behind me, and he just whacked me right in the back end. Just, just pretty good heart. And he laughed real big and he says, where's the booty preacher? <laughs> Pirate, booty, you know, all right. Uh, uh, every time he'd see me, he saw me at West Blade the other night in front of all the guys, there was about six or seven of them hanging out there, getting everything cleared after the game. He hollered at me again, where's the booty preacher? And I start walking around like this, you know. Um, those are good times. Um, he, he loved serving in Bladen County. He loved those he served and those that he served with. He wanted your best, and he was we, willing to help you get there. He would let you know how well you were doing, but he also, if needed, could show you how to do it a different way. Is that a good way to put it? <laughs> he loved and cared enough about you that if he thought you were in need, Someone to talk to, or it would go something like this. My phone would ring. Hey, preacher, you busy? I need you to check on whoever. He says, I want you to just give them a chance to talk and vent in a safe environment. He says, I don't want you to tell me anything. They say, he said, I just want them to be okay and get where they need to be at this time. If there's anything else I can do to help them, you let me know. But other than that, you just tell me if they're okay. He loved to go to communications, talk and pick and love, and probably a little junk talk in there. Um, always loved to go in there. Daniel loved to hang, be hanging out and working 
with his people on the road or taking the bad guys off the street. I don't know if there was anything he loved any more than that and maybe kicking a door in. I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, when, he, when, he, when he hurt his leg, uh, it was my time to get back at him a little bit. You know, he was in his office, and you'd go in there, and his leg would be shaking like that, you know, and his, he'd be doing all kinds of things. And I'd say, uh, Captain Clark, what you doing behind that desk today? <laughs> he'd just uh, start getting red right here. <laughs> I'd say, Captain Clark, where's your weapon at? And, you know, that was in the car, probably. And uh, he said, Preacher... I said, it's just get back. That's all it is. It's just get back. <laughs> he had a struggle. He wanted to be out there with his, with his people. He was known as the big guy. All them muscles. And he had a big heart that was bigger than him. He was larger than life at times. Jax was his main man. And he was Jax. If you're not in the gym, he was on you. If you are in the gym, he was pushing you. Don't give up. He even tried to encourage me to get in the gym. I told him, I says, Captain, you'll kill me. He says, I'll take all that soft muscle and put it where it needs to be. I said, I don't think you that good. <laughs> Come Monday morning. Some of you are going to hear his voice. Get up and get in the gym. Amanda gave me a couple of pictures of Daniel and myself that she took at some of these functions we had at the sheriff's office. I didn't realize it, but when I got the picture, we're standing there and he's smiling with that grin on his face, rubbing my stomach. <laughs> that one I'm going to frame. <laughs> carried a great burden in his heart and mind for the Bladen County Sheriff's Office, especially those that he served with him and under him and walked on a daily basis. He wanted you to have the best. Cameron mentioned living the dream, but he didn't finish it. I thought at the first that he was doing this to irritate me because I'd show up on a scene or show up somewhere and I'd say, how you doing, Captain Clark? Living the dream, doing the Lord's work. So I thought he was, you know, messing with me. But I got to understand he did that to everybody. <laughs> I'm going to read something to you. My son texted me the other day. It's a song by Toby Mack. And I'm not going to sing it. I can't, I can't do it what they just did. But I just want you to hear the words because I know, as, Cam, as Pastor Cameron said, as Pastor Al said, you're hurting today. You're struggling. That's normal. You're mad. You're angry. You're, you got all kinds of emotions going. It's okay. That's, we're human, right? We're human. But I want you to listen to this. And uh, This song was written by Toby Mack after he lost his first son in a, a tragic situation. It almost got him. But listen. It's been a long year. It almost took me down. I swear, life was so good, I'm not so sure we knew what we had. I'll never be the same man, I'll never feel like I felt before. It's been a hard year, it almost took me down. But when my world broke into pieces, you were there faithfully. When I cried out to you, Jesus, you made a way for me. I may never be the same man, but I'm the man who still believes. When I cried out to you, Jesus, you were there faithfully. I've had a hard time finding the blue in the skies above me. And if I'm keeping it real, I've been half faking the happy they see. I may look like the same man, but I'm half the man I was. It's been a hard year. It almost took me down. But when my world broke into pieces, you were there faithfully. When I cried out to you, Jesus, you made a way for me. I may never be the same man, but I'm the man who still believes. When I cried out to you, Jesus, you were there faithfully. 
In my darkest hour, you met me so quietly, so gently. You said you'd never leave, and you stood by your word. So quietly, so gently, in all my pain, you met me. You said you'd never leave me, and you stood by your word. Because when my word broke into pieces, when my world broke into pieces, you were there faithfully. When I cried out to Jesus, you made a way for me. I may never be the same man, but I am a man who still believes. When I cried out to you, Jesus, you were faithfully there. When I cried out to you, Jesus, you were there faithfully. I want to read a couple of scriptures that I feel like goes with this. I think the main one is Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear. What can man do to me? And John 14, 6 is one of my favorite verses. Jesus, is, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I think Cameron shared that pretty, pretty clear with us this morning, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And I pray that if you're here today and you don't know Christ, that you won't leave here without knowing him. Right where you sit, you can surrender your life to him. If you are a Christian, I pray that you'll draw closer to him. Uh, he'll help us with these hurts. He, we, we live in a, a, a world that we're not promised. We're not promised not to have tribulation. And who else can get us through? I want to close and read something that uh, I was asked to read uh, by some at the sheriff's office. Um, uh, it was written by Corporal Joe Butler. And I believe this represents the thoughts of those that serve at the Bladen County Sheriff's Office. There was a fog as I put on my uniform. It was though muscle memory putting my side, it was through muscle memory putting my sidearm in my holster and securing it and signaling to myself that I was ready to check in to service. My radio was silent, the fog thicker than it was just a moment ago. I cannot bring myself to find the simple words to start my shift. Strength, fortitude, metal, all adjectives that are required of a first responder and of a peacekeeper. They are used to describe acts we perform, but for some they are exemplify it on a daily basis. Captain Daniel Clark was one of these individuals. No matter what situation was unfolding, if you were at a loss for direction, he was there to provide it. If a fog is what surrounds us and confuses us now, then what is needed is a light or a, a lighthouse to show us the way through. Captain Clark was a lighthouse, always providing a path forward through the most difficult task. If you found yourself alone during a dangerous situation or felt fear uh, starting to take control, more times than not, Captain Clark would seem to just materialize into providing and to provide direction and support. Seeing that towering figure standing by your side could inspire anyone uh, the fear and the doubt would disappear and be replaced by self-assurance and resolve. Captain Clark trained daily uh, from being in the fitness center, keeping his uh, physicality at its peak, or continuing his education across law, fire, and EMS. He was a machine from office debacles to critical incidents in the field. Uh, he would triage each incident with the same confidence. Captain Clark was a commanding officer who was a warrior at heart. Even from a command position, he was always out in the field with us. How fitting that his first name was Daniel, an ode to Daniel from the Old Testament. There is no doubt that if one of us had, walked, had to walk into the lion's den, Captain Clark would have been the one. More than likely, if this had occurred, he would have all of them tamed and he would now have, we would now have lines instead of canine units. 
Strength, no matter how powerful, eventually fails. The perpetual trauma first responders are exposed to chips away at all of us like waves eroding on a shore. The life of expectancy is shorter. Divorce rates are higher. Coping mechanisms are in constant use. The sacrifice each of us choose to make rarely can be explained with words to those outside the profession. That's what makes us a family, a dysfunctional one, but a family nonetheless. The sacrifice that Captain Daniel Clark made and that others continue to make at the altar of freedom and public safety will not be forgotten. It will continue, it will continue to serve and inspire for the rest of us while the line just became thinner. Each of us will use the training and experience Captain Clark instilled in us to hold it. Big guy, I hope that you find the peace that you fought so hard to keep. Voices break the silence. One after another, brothers and sisters checking on, starting their vehicles, ready to hold the line. The bond that holds each of us together, the oath we swore, form a collective light to shine through the fog. My voice finds the strength through listening to the bravery of others ready to continue the fight. We will continue, as Captain Clark always said, living the dream and doing the Lord's work. 1041. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for Daniel. Thank you for what he meant to his family and his community. Thank you for what he meant for this law enforcement family and all those in Bladen County, all the first responders, Lord. We just thank you for his life and thank you for how he has probably touched each one of us that's in here in some way. And Lord, we pray that you'll please be with his family, Lord. His family that's needs your help and your strength, his Bladen County Sheriff's Office family that needs your strength, other friends, other acquaintances that needs your strength. Lord, you are our hope. Lord, we know that without a shadow of a doubt. Help us now in Jesus' name. Amen. We love and miss you, big guy. my feet is shaking like a leaf God you're still good to me when my hope is all but gone and I'm barely hanging on God you're still good to me when my heart can find a beat when it's dark and I can see I will put my hope
I will 